Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? As you know, this is a program where we are vitally interested in the Bible. The Bible, which is God's book. The Bible, which is very, very carefully written by God himself. So that every word and this, every sentence and the spelling of the individual words comes right from the mouth of God. Under no circumstance are we ever to look at the Bible as some kind of a casual writing or something that is approximately true or that uh, is, uh, is uh, superficially uh, something we can understand. It, uh, we have to remember that every word in the Bible in the original languages of Hebrew of the Old Testament and Greek of the New were right from the mouth of God. And uh, therefore, if we are going to teach the Bible, we have to be super careful to check out what we're teaching to make sure we are teaching faithfully because it is so easy to draw a wrong conclusion. And until we have tested our conclusion concerning any, with the teaching of anything in the Bible, we want to make sure we have checked it out throughout the whole Bible in great detail. Now, we have a, a, a listener in, uh, let me see, what city? That's in Colombia, Colombia, uh, where we have a listener uh, who uh, is uh, asking a question about the second psalm, uh, the second psalm, uh, which is Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2. There we read, now, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord or against Jehovah and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away uh, their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. Jeho the Lord shall have them in derision. Uh, the, uh, this, this question comes from Colombia, Colombia. And uh, the question is, what does it mean here, a vain thing? The people imagine a vain thing. Well, you know, the fact is, mankind was created in the image of God. And therefore, we have a mind that is far, far, far superior to that of an animal, and uh, we can think out a whole lot of ideas uh, and uh, uh, imagine this and imagine that. It's another, it's a synonym for what we think about when our imagination is what is going on in our minds as we think out uh, various uh, solutions or various problems or various ideas that we are thinking about. But here God is speaking about people imagining a vain thing. Now, the word vain in the Bible is a, Bible, is a word that means foolish or empty or worthless. Uh, the fact is that, and, and the context here is that uh, they are thinking uh, foolishly how they might come out from under the law of God. As it says in verse 3, let us break their bands. Incidentally, you notice that's a plural word there because, you see, God reveals himself as one God and yet as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is indeed a divine mystery. But nevertheless, I, I, the Holy Spirit is eternal God in every sense of the word. The Lord Jesus is eternal God. In every sense of the word, the Father is eternal God in every sense of the word. And here it is bringing it all together. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, what are the bands and the cords that they want to break away from? Well, the law of God, the law of God. You see, 
uh, we are under the law of God uh, and uh, the law in the sense that if we break the law we are subject to the penalties demanded by the law and since every human being breaks the law of God unless we find a solution to this problem and that solution comes through the Lord Jesus uh, we, unless we find that solution uh, we are going to continue to be under that law it is going to condemn us and send us to hell and yet in their foolish imaginations in their foolish thinking unsaved man thinks that somehow that law does not apply to them they are free from that they can do as they wish and somehow they're not going to come under the wrath of God and God uh, uh, laughs at them derisively indicating no way no way uh, there is going to be a judgment day when you have to answer to God for your sins and so uh, uh, here God is underscoring the fact that we can think what we wish you know man piteously he, he thinks that he knows everything he thinks uh, we think we have, we have the finest ideas in the world but really our thinking is just a a tiny little peanut compared with the monumental thinking mind of God as he uh, plans his strategies as he plans his plans uh, for mankind and for the universe and so on uh, and so we're if we're really going to be wise we're never going to trust in our own thinking our own foolish imagination our vain things uh, we are going to be uh, asking the Lord for greater and greater trust in the mind of God and that's why incidentally that the Bible is so marvelous because it gives us uh, the revelation from the mind of God and anything we can understand from the Bible and I know that we have understood it correctly it means that we have come to ultimate truth in that area of our thinking and nothing can be more wonderful than that but thank you uh, 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 for sharing that question Columbia and now we're going to go to our first caller on our telephone lines good evening welcome to open forum good evening brother camping yes it's good to um, hear your voice again um, I want to ask you something I just listened to you say about the um, not you say by the way the word of God say um about the laughing, uh, the Lord will, how did he just put it, laugh and he will have them in derision. The one you just said, the one you just talked about with the Columbia, the scripture you just gave us? Well, now, I, I missed something in your question. You're, you're asking about the, what confusion? Okay, you just read the scripture from Columbia. Yeah. That he asked about um, the, the tail end of the um, scripture was speaking about God laughing. Yes. Okay, it, now, God speaks about laughing um, in other parts of the Bible, too. And I remember you telling us that it doesn't mean um, he's happy to see people go into judgment. But what, because the world's idea of laughter is ha, 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 that's funny. So what does that, what does that, what does well, God mean? Well, first of all, well, first of all, the, uh, I'm glad you raised the question because when right. the Bible talks here about uh, God laughing derisively and in derision, uh, we want to make sure that we understand what God is saying. The fact is, the whole business of God's salvation plan or God's uh, spiritual plan for mankind is not a laughing matter in any sense it is not comedy at all some people like to say well Jesus had a real sense of humor or God had a real sense of humor because of this or that that's utter nonsense 
the whole Bible is a, indicating a, in a very solemn and proper way the the great truths uh, and the phenomenal uh, uh, problem when we when we break the law of God and so on. But here God is using that word derision. Uh, that is. Uh, he's not laughing in in, in with in, there's no comedy about this there is no uh, this is not a laughing matter but he is using the language that we use where he is saying look you you people look you people you think you're so wise you think you're so smart you think you've got it all worked out and really you're nothing you have uh, your minds are not able to contemplate truth at all and uh, and uh, it's uh, 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 right now you think you're so great but wait until you stand before the judgment throne of god that's really the sense of this psalm too that it is a it is a the laughing of derision not the laughing of of happiness or of uh, uh, or anything of that nature. Now, it is true that laughter is not wrong. We find, for example, that uh, Sarah laughed when she was told that she would bear a son. It was the laughter of happiness. God does use passages in the Bible where he speaks about there is joy and happiness, and laughter can go along with that, and uh, and. Uh, in, and uh, that's in that sense, laughter would be proper. But in our in our society, uh, we uh, think of laughter mostly as everything is a big joke, a big joke. And that's why the sitcoms, the situation comedies on TV, for example, are very popular uh, because people just want to. Uh, it reminds me of the. You read about the King Arthur fables and so on, and the jester in the king's court. It was his job to keep the king happy and uh, by telling jokes. Well, that is not found in the Bible. It's either the beautiful laughter of joy and happiness, or it, in this sense, only God speaks of himself as derisively uh, in derision, uh, laughing at those who claim that they have it all figured out and they have no idea what uh, what trauma they're heading for. Thank you, sir, for that. And I have just one last question, if I may, sir. Yes. Um, it's in Proverbs 27. Um, it's verse 4. Now, I know the Proverbs, I know you've often spoke about them, Mom, that you haven't worked with many of them, so I'll understand if you feel you're not qualified to speak on it. But I'm going to ask anyway, just with the hope that you might have some kernel of All right, understanding. Proverbs 27, 27 verse, verse 4. four. Uh, there we read, Wrath is cruel, and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Now, uh, like uh, you said, I have not worked on this for a long time, but you know, if this is the same word, and it probably is, is the word jealous. Jealous. You know, God is a jealous God. Now, you, uh, we use the word envy or jealousy in a, in a sinful way. We are jealous of someone who is... Uh, uh, has more money than we have or has more friends or has more popularity or or who has, lives in a bigger house or or we envy each other and that is sinful jealousy and that should have no part in the life of a true believer uh, but God is jealous for his name he, is, he alone is the creator he alone is the judge of all the earth and and uh, god uh, shows his offense he shows his uh, wrath upon those who want to worship some other god which he makes up by nature all the peoples of the world until god actually does save them uh, we will worship anybody else except the god of the bible 
and uh, which is a terrible, terrible thing to do since these other gods had nothing to do with creation, nothing to do with judging the world. In fact, they're dead. There is no, they can't give life of any kind, and yet uh, we hold them, or mankind by nature holds them in higher regard than God himself, who is the very source of life and who is the supreme ruler and so on. And so God is very jealous for his good name. He is a jealous God. And that's why it says here, who can stand before envy or jealousy? That is the jealousy of God. Uh, it's uh, 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 to fall into the, uh, into the hands of an angry God because we have been serving the wrong God it is a dreadful situation. Thank you very much, to, um, Brother Campin. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. I had a yes. Just a moment. I had a question about uh, Luke chapter twenty-one. Luke twenty-one. Yes. Uh, where it talks about the fig tree and all the trees in verse 29. Yes, we read, And he spake to them a parable, Behold, the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And what is your question? My question is about all the trees. What do I know what the, the fig tree represents Israel, but what do all the trees represent? Well, the question is, do, we have to start out with the fig tree. Does the fig tree represent Israel? Uh, we do know when we search the Bible that the fig tree can, whenever you read the word fig tree, it can refer, depending on the context, it can refer to natural Israel, as it does in Mark 13. When you see the fig tree and leaf, you know that summer is nigh. The context clearly shows that it is uh, talking about national Israel, and it ties back to Mark 11, when the fig tree was cursed. That also is talking about, talking about national Israel. But when we look at this word, fig tree, uh, we find it is not talking about national Israel. It is talking about the Lord Jesus. The way, for example, uh, God spoke to Nathaniel in John 1 uh, when uh, he uh, told Nathaniel, I, when I saw you under the fig tree, uh, or in another place in the Old Testament, every man talking about those who become true believers, will sit under their vine and under their fig tree. That is Christ. And so in this context, we'll find that it's not talking about the, a fig tree without that only bears leaves. Uh, that's very heavily emphasized in Mark 13, a fig tree that has leaves, or the, uh, or the fig tree was withered in Mark 11. Uh, it, but this is a fig tree and all the trees. Now, in the Bible, very frequently, God speaks about the peoples of the world as a cedar tree or as a, uh, as a sycamore tree. Uh, uh, God uses various as a palm tree, for example, in Psalm 92. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, he uses the figure of, of trees or a forest of those who are true believers. And so here he is saying, uh, as he is uh, prophesying concerning our day, the context is our day, behold the fig tree, behold the Lord Jesus Christ, and all the trees, all those who are becoming believers, when they now shoot forth. Notice it's not saying that they're coming into leaf. Uh, they, it's different language altogether than in, from Mark 13. When they now shoot, shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer, and summer has to do with harvest. It's, a, it's the latter rain harvest. It's the second jubilee of our day harvest is now nigh at hand. Uh, 
So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Or it's interesting, you know, that Christ said uh, that John the Baptist uh, preached the kingdom of God is at hand. And Christ reiterated that when he began to preach. The kingdom of God is now at hand. Why? Why? Because Christ himself, who is the very essence of the kingdom, was there. Was there. And when he's saying here the kingdom of God is at hand, it means it's right time for Christ to again put in his appearance. In fact, he has already come as the judge in his spirit essence to uh, begin the judging process. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Yes, hi. Um, is this like a private conversation? I noticed it's your radio um, family program. Yeah, um, oh, excuse me, like, excuse uh, me, excuse me. Would you turn your radio off, please? Oh, yeah, I apologize. Yeah, now go ahead, start again. Yes, sir. I was calling in. Um, I sent a note, like a message in the mail uh, back last week sometime. And um, I was calling for prayer tonight. Um, where are you located, if you don't mind me asking? Well, uh, we are. Uh, I'm Excuse present, me? I, I, I'm presently in Oakland, California, but uh, uh, each uh, there are some of our stations, and they're scattered all over through the United States. Some of them do have a time when they call prayer time. Some do not have it. And, uh, you know, when you write in and call for prayer, you must bear in mind that uh, that uh, the first thing to do is remember that God will listen to you just as quickly as anybody else. You can begin to pray for your uh, whatever you are uh, concerned about, and you want to get in the habit of coming to God repeatedly with whatever your concerns are and your thanksgiving and so on. Uh, this is part of our worship activity with the Lord as we, as in prayer, as we show our trust in Him. Hmm. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good morning. Hello, this is Robert. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yes, I have a quick question. Could you turn to Revelation um, chapter 8, verse 8? Revelation 8, verse 8. There we read, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Is that the verse? Yes, I had two questions. My first question is, um, what does the blood represent? Well, the, the blood represents uh, someone has given his life. Uh, the uh, blood represents either the fact that someone is under the judgment of God, if it's the blood of Christ that's being talked about, it is the fact that he has given his life for our sins. Now, is this Christ's blood. Pardon? Is Christ's blood? But in this uh, verse, the third of the sea became blood. It means that. Uh, uh, remember, Christ spoke in parables. This this is parabolic language. Uh, it, it, God is uh, painting a portrait, a word a portrait, of a great mountain that is burning with fire and is cast in the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Now, there are several uh, emphases here. There are, first of all, a mountain. A mountain is a synonym or spiritually represents a kingdom. Uh, and uh, burning with fire means it, it is a kingdom under the judgment of God. In this context, the sea represents hell, uh, being under the judgment of God. And the third part represents those who are citizens of that kingdom, 
but uh, but have not become saved. They uh, they are they become his blood. That is, they're under the wrath of God. Now, when we tie all of this together, we find what God is prophesying here is uh, that this time, when the uh, external representation of the kingdom of God, which are the local congregations, they are now under the wrath of God. It's as if they have been cast into the sea. Now, the members of the local congregations, they are convinced they are true believers, that they and God normally or, uh, or frequently uses the third part to signify those are, who are citizens of the kingdom of God. They externally belong to God, so they are called the third part, but now they're in the sea, uh, 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 and, and the sea is, is full of blood. That is their blood. They are, in other words, they're under the wrath of God, and God is preparing them for judgment. Now, all of that is... In this verse, this verse is a very uh, picturesque and descriptive verse that is talking about the situation that exists today in the local congregations. Oh, okay. And then my second question is, could you turn to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 11? Isaiah 5, verse 11. Let's look at that. 11 through 12, actually. All right, Isaiah 5, verse 11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them, and the harp, and the viola, the tabret, the pipe, and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Is that Are those the verses? Yeah, those are the verses. My question is, I'm a classical jazz musician, and I just wanted to know if the part where it talks about the viola and the tabret, is it implying that the uh, musicians that play worldly music no, this is so using again. Remember, Christ spoke in parables, and God is simply using, uh, 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 speaking about those who are. Oh, hold on just a moment. I'll be right back with you. Uh, in uh, Isaiah chapter 5, God is speaking about uh, someone who is uh, running after uh, wine and strong drink and then making all kinds of music with various instruments. Uh, and uh, uh, the context clearly indicates that they're following after other Gospels. Now, the New Testament version of this is very curious that this, this, uh, these two verses are picked up in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, where we read in verse 18, verse 18, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And now to be filled with the Spirit means we have to be following the true gospel. And we cannot be following some kind of a false gospel. But then God picks up the story about music. And you know when you're a musician, and particularly if you've been cut your eye teeth on jazz music of various kinds, and uh, you, life becomes very difficult, just like uh, uh, in some occupations. There are things that you just can't do. Uh, for example, if you, uh, if you are a, a true believer, you can't operate a store if it's required that you have to be open on Sunday because that's a violation of the law of God. In other words, to live in this world as a child of God does mean that we have to deny ourselves. We can't do always just like the world does. We have, there are limitations on what we can do. And, uh, and uh, here it is uh, speaking about music. Now notice what he says, what God says in Ephesians 5 verse uh, 19, verse 19. 
Verse 18, don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking uh, uh, to yourselves uh, in psalms and hymns and uh, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that is the... The biblical statement insofar as what music ought to be. It parallels to what we read in, in uh, Colossians. Um, let me see. In Colossians, uh, where we read in verse uh, 16 of Colossians chapter 3, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns. Now, what are the psalms? Well, they're, they're, they're uh, songs that come right out of the Bible itself, the book of psalms and hymns. There are other spiritual songs that come out of the Bible. And then God underscores it, and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, there again, God has added something very, very important. We're singing not to entertain ourselves. Uh, you know, the world's music is designed for entertainment principally, although some of the very raunchy music is, is designed to foster great sin in the lives of, of those who are singing. But uh, but basically, or to start with, it is for entertainment purposes. But that's not the nature of our singing as a child of God. We have to choose songs, that, and we're not we're not singing to entertain. We're singing to the glory of God, and that changes our whole attitude toward music. And so, just like the man who is got a lot of gift for merchandising and he's always operated a, 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 some kind of a retail store of some kind that was always open on Sunday now he becomes a true believer and he knows he's got to get out of it because that is not does not comport with the life of a true believer and so someone has been brought up with a certain kind of a music idea and it's like I, uh, we've already discussed that, uh, and he finds he's got to change all together, and it may even uh, ruin his musical career. He may have to go into something altogether differently as he continues to live to the glory of God. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Hello. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Uh, my question is, I have a, I have, a, I had a loved one that passed away, right? And I'm a believer, but I know that he wasn't. How is a Christian supposed to, you know, feel or act or, well, you know, that's... think if he know that he's not in heaven, well, if he's suffering the rest of his life? Well. Uh, you you put your finger on a very very practical problem because this world is the valley of death every day people all around us die the funeral parlors are always active and there's always people being buried in the cemetery and uh, when anyone if it, particularly if it's a loved one or a dear friend uh, then that death gets really close at hand there are two, two uh, big questions. Uh, first of all, what happened to our loved one? Secondly, what if that were me in that coffin instead of that loved one? Where would I be? In other words, when a loved one or a personal friend dies and we're at the funeral, we have to be thinking, you know, that could have been me. Would I be now in heaven with the Lord or am I going down to a place of silence to await the judgment of the last day and uh, so it's time to really take stock of where I am and if I find I'm not, a, not at all sure about being a believer I, I 
I know I'm going to begin to beg the Lord and begin to cry out for mercy if I really think about this seriously. But now, what about my loved one? And I happen to know that or that he gave no evidence of being a child of God. Oh, it is sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. It is so sad. Uh, but we can't change anything. Uh, God's law demands that there be punishment for sin. But the only th way we can comfort ourselves, and this incidentally is true comfort, is that whatever God does, He does it perfectly. Uh, in other words, there will be no injustice of any kind that is done. And we just have to leave that loved one in the hand of the Lord, even though we know that uh, there was no evidence of salvation. We have to just leave it there and know that God's justice demanded uh, uh, the penalty of eternal damnation if that person truly died as an unsaved person. And... and uh, this is why as we think about the end of the world coming in a few years uh, every everyone who is seriously thinking about it we ought to be in mourning we ought to be crying all day long because we have so many friends and loved ones who can't see it at all they're they're just uh, blissfully going on their life just leave, acting like uh, it's all well and good and yet we know that in a few years they're going to be standing in line for their for their time when they have to uh, have to uh, stand before the judgment throne of God, and we already know what the penalty is: eternal damnation. Oh my my, this is a sad sad world to live in, and the only thing that can bring us joy is that we know that God is perfect in all that He does. And right now, he doesn't reassure us, yes, yes, there is this all this terrible judgment day that's coming, but it's also now a time when a great multitude, which no man can number, that are being saved, and, and we can focus our eyes on that also, and just rejoice, rejoice that this too is happening. Just have one more question in Matthew twenty four twenty nine. Matthew twenty four, twenty nine. Let's look at I just that. wanted to know if that was literal or not. Yeah, well, I I I don't know how to answer that. Uh, that is talking about in Matthew twenty four twenty nine. It's talking about immediately after the tribulation of those days. Let me read that a minute. Uh, in Matthew twenty four, twenty nine. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. At least we know that there is a spiritual dimension to that because uh, when the moon is, uh, when the sun is darkened and the moon shall not give her light, it means that's a figure to indicate the gospel is ended. There is no more salvation. There is no more mercy of God. The moon is a reference spiritually to the law of God. And the law of God gives light. It, it tells us about our sin. It tells us about Christ as the Savior. It gives us all kinds of information about our relationship with God. But when uh, the end of the tribulation comes, uh, it means that... Uh, that God has finished uh, applying the word of God. The, 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 uh, the, the moon now, we have another reference where it has become blood. All that is left is that it, it, the law is going to bring judgment on the unsaved, and it is giving no more light. And the sun, uh, the sun uh, is uh, uh, darkened, and the sun is a reference to the Lord Jesus that that again there is no light of the gospel uh, now that at least we know is in view here now uh, literally uh, just if, if there's some aspect of this I don't know I have no idea well thank you it's good to hear your voice again I haven't heard you for about 10 years due to my old location but thank you 
Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, good evening, Brother Camping. Two of those simple questions. Uh, I have one question is, how can a woman uh, as a wife, uh, and what's her part and role? And spoken in parables, um, I'm kind of lost on that one. You, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, first of all, what is the role of a wife? You see, uh, 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 Ephesians 5 says it as well as any, I suppose. But, you know, God doesn't just talk about the wife. We've got to be very careful, especially if we're a man. Uh, we like to look at our wives and say, uh, look, uh, this is what I expect of you. Here we read in Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourself unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Oh, boy, we want our wives to submit to us. Well, that's fine. Uh, 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 she she has to remember that God has established a chain of command even in the family situation. On the other side of the coin, I always I want to recommend that we husbands uh, twice as often read the verse of 20, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. And that's a big mouthful. That's a big statement. Because Christ loved those. This is God is not talking about His uh, external church. He, he's talking about those who are part of the eternal church, the, which Christ is still building, and He has bestowed His love on those individuals when they were totally unlovable. Uh, he made us His bride, and 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 He. Uh, paid an enormous cost he emptied himself of his glory in order to be our savior and so that this is a dramatic statement for us husbands we have to always be thinking not about what I want oh I'm the boss in his home no way we're to be thinking as the head of this house I have a first responsibility to love my wife as Christ loved the church and that means I want the very best for us that means that I will deny myself as a man of things that I would uh, uh, rather have uh, if, if, if somehow that will be offensive to my wife or detrimental to my wife's well-being and uh, and because I want to love my wife as Christ loved the church and then when we become a husband like that and now we have a marriage where we, uh, where uh, she gladly will be, will be submissive to this kind of a husband. This is the ideal that God is setting up. Now, insofar as your question, Christ spoke in parables. Now, for example, we just looked at uh, Matthew 24, verse uh, 29. And uh, the, uh, there's an earthly story here about the sun being darkened and the moon not shining. Uh, 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 not giving her light and we saw that uh, we can search the Bible and and find uh, uh, spiritually what the moon could refer to spiritually what the sun could refer to and that it, and we find that points to the fact that the moon uh, could represent the law of God and the Son and the Lord Jesus Christ and and uh, uh, then we can begin to understand the spiritual uh, side, uh, the spiritual teaching of this particular verse. Or remember, we looked at at uh, Revelation, where it talked about a great mountain burning with fire that was cast into the sea, and the third of the sea became blood. All of those figures, we have to search the Bible. What could a mountain refer to? What does burning fire refer to? What is the, could the sea refer to? Spiritually, spiritually, spiritually. And we come to a conclusion what this could be saying spiritually. Then we test our conclusion against everything else the Bible teaches about the subject that we're looking at to make sure that we haven't gone astray in making the application of the spiritual to this language of the Bible. I but, see, I see. 
one, one more question, Brother Campion. Yes. Uh, as far as being uh, uh, in the book of life, I'm kind of weary about understanding, and then my life has changed in understanding. Um, what, what can I do if I know, you know, I, I'm into the book, and I'm trying, I'm learning, and it's kind of difficult. Anything you could tell me to let me know, anyone else that I could uh, know, or because I get very frightened when I know in the book of life and the things I've done in life, Man, I would, I'm in very deep trouble. <laughs> well, the fact is, I, I, your concern is not the book of life. Your concern is, are you a child of God or not? If you're a child of God, then you are eternally in the book of life. If you're not a child of God uh, and you don't become one, you will be rubbed out of the book of life. You can't... Re uh, you. Uh, 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 and and uh, you've never been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So the, the, it always boils back to this question. Is Jesus my Savior? Uh, the answer is, um, I, uh, how can I know? And the Bible's answer comes back and says, if we say we know him, we will keep his commandments. Why is that true? Because the Bible teaches that when we became saved, we were born again. What does that mean? That we have been given a brand new resurrected soul. What is the condition of that new resurrected soul? We will never want to sin again. And it's in that new resurrected soul that we've been given eternal life. And that God himself indwells us and and works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. So the big, uh, so the, uh, now I can begin to examine my life. Do I really delight in the word of God? Do I really passionately want to do the will of God? Uh, and so that it translates into a life of greater and greater obedience and, or a life of uh, where we become greatly distressed when we commit a sin in our life, which is still possible because we're still living in a body that has not been saved as yet. And that's really the whole essence of the gospel. That is the fundamental essence of the gospel, that we, uh, uh, we're desiring that we might become a child of God, and we know that only God can save us. We have to wait upon Him. Uh, we know that God has elected those that he planned to save, and he is not a respecter of persons. Therefore, I could just as well be one of God's elect as anybody else. I know, and secondly, he, he saves those who are sinners, and if I look at myself honestly and, and uh, get off my pride and I uh, just look at myself honestly. I have to admit, yes, that's me. I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. So I qualify. I could be one of God's elect. Uh, and, uh, and then I learn from the Bible that God is merciful. Maybe he'll be merciful to me. Uh, I, uh, but I have to wait upon him. I do know that the environment in which he saves is the word of God. And therefore, of course... I, if I'm serious about this, I'm going to be spending more and more time in the Word of God, praying that I might have some understanding, praying that I might be obedient to what I read there. And then I wait upon God, and I, under no circumstance, dictate to Him and say, Oh, Lord, you got to save me today, uh, certainly not later than next week. I, no way. I, we may be like the thief on the cross who an hour before he died as a, the violent death of a criminal and being crucified and then he became saved that could happen to any one of us so as long as there is life as long as Christ does not return the hope of salvation still rests with any one of us who know that we're uh, who are quite or, or Concerned about whether we are saved or not. But the fear, though, I have is what it, what bothers me the most. That should I be afraid of oh, Jesus? Uh, well, you better be afraid. You know, if I knew I were not saved, I would be frightened out of my skin. Because just think of it: if you would die tonight of a heart attack, 
and you died unsaved, you're going to spend eternity in hell. It's that final. And so it's uh, every human being before they're saved is in an enormous predicament. And uh, it's, uh, it's, and, and all of this business is real. We're not talking philosophically. We're talking about the real facts that every, every day, uh, millions of people die. And, uh, and the next thing they're going to wake up at the judgment throne of God, uh, being ready to be cast into hell. And that's all very, very, very substantive. And so we better be scared. But in your fear, go to the Lord. Go to the Lord and go to the Bible. Go to the Bible. So, because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. God is uh, that faith that God is talking about is Christ Himself. He will come through His Word to save you if that is God's plan. And and secondly, as you go to the Bible, I uh, wait. You have to wait upon the Lord, but you can constantly come to Him. Oh Lord, I'm frightened out of my wits. Have mercy, have mercy, and and uh, and uh, that'll just cause you to. Uh, if you're serious about this, you're going to be wanting to read the Bible more and more carefully, and learning all that you can from it. And again and again, you'll find yourself praying, Oh Lord. Uh, help me to be obedient to what I find there because I know if I'm not obedient, that's sin. And sin is what's sending me to hell. Oh, God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And, 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 and please, please, I beseech you, I implore you, uh, I beg of you, oh, Lord, have mercy and save this wretch that I am. And, and, and just, just keep up with it. Just keep going. Uh, pleading to God for mercy uh, until finally if God does save you you'll begin to find that increasingly you have a desire to be obedient to God you're only happy when you're being obedient to the word of God and that will begin to uh, impress upon you that it sounds I begin to feel like maybe God has saved me okay I, well, is there any scriptures that I could look up that you could help me out with well, the, the, I mean, if there isn't, if not a prayers or something that I could follow or... No, any, this is not a matter of following a certain prayer. The, uh, I mean, the best thing to do is start reading the Bible. Start reading any place in the Bible. Start reading um, uh, the uh, Philippians. Start reading Ephesians. Uh, start reading the Psalms. Uh, start, just get in the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Think of this. The thief on the cross, what part of the Bible did he hear? Did he hear anybody talking about salvation? No. He heard the Lord Jesus say a few words, Father, uh, or, or my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I thirst. I, 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 he heard Jesus give a little instruction to Mary and a little instruction to his disciple John, but uh, he heard Christ speaking. He heard the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. And the God applied that word that he heard to his life, and he became a child of God. So the, the important thing is, is to start getting into the Bible. Get into the Bible. And the more you read it uh, the, uh, and, uh, and pray, just pray. Oh, Lord, I, by nature, I, I never have been that interested in the Bible. Oh, Lord, have mercy and make me diligent to read the Bible. Help me to read it carefully and slowly and and oh Lord, help me to be obedient. In other words, cast your cares on God. Uh, just uh, ask Him for strength in every aspect of, of what your of what your concern is. Thank you, Brother Kemp. I appreciate it. God bless. Thank you for calling. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, I've heard you talk about the biblical timeline of history before on your show. And, yes. And, you know, you're right. Not, not one instance did God change his mind when a certain event was to, to take place, right? Like, 
Uh, I'm sorry. Abraham. What about God changing his mind? Well, when we look at the biblical timeline of history, we see that not one time did God change his mind when an event was to take place. For instance, when Israel was to go into Egypt, they went into Egypt. When they were delivered out of Egypt, they were delivered out of Egypt, precisely according to God's timeline. Am I right? Well, what is, the, what is the point you're making? Well, the point I'm trying to make is that it's very obvious that 2011 is the end time year. So why would he change his mind at all about that? Isn't that almost a for sure? Oh, oh okay. I, I, I'm getting the thrust of your question. Yeah. The, the fact is, uh, when, we, when we talk about, oh my, uh, yeah, uh, when we talk about the timeline of history, God knows the end from the beginning. Oh, hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. We have a caller on the line who has introduced a very, very interesting idea, a, a concept or a question. Uh, is it possible that God could change his mind? You know, when we go to the book of Jonah, God said... I'm going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days. God set a timeline. I'm going to destroy Nineveh in 40 days. But he did not destroy Nineveh in 40 days because of a law that God himself has established in the, in the law book, which is the Bible, and that is found in Jeremiah chapter 18, where we read in verse 7, at what instance, this is Jeremiah 18, verse 7, at what instance I shall speak concerning a, a, a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have pronounced uh, turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I should do unto them. In other words, uh, Nineveh did repent. They did sit in sackcloth and ashes and, and uh, 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 prayed, uh, prayed, prayed to God, Oh God, may, may it, would it be possible that you might have mercy on us. And God did have mercy and he did not destroy them. Now, God comes to the nations today, to the churches today. If you would repent, if you would repent, uh, I, I, or God has declared, I'm going to destroy you. And he set up a timetable. I'm going to destroy you. And, and in principle, if the world would repent, if the world like Nineveh would sit in sackcloth and ashes and cry out to God, that's a figure, of course, sitting in sackcloth and ashes of, of total brokenness, a total broken and a contrite heart, cry out to God for mercy, uh, then uh, God would have the right to change his timeline. He could say, oh, well, then I had planned in the year 2011 to destroy the world, but I am going to uh, delay it now for some other time. The problem, however, is that God knows the end from the beginning. He knows that mankind are not going to repent. They're not going to change. The local congregations, uh, the people in the local congregations basically are not going to cry to God for mercy. They're going to continue in their self-assurance that, uh, that they have the right gospel when in actuality they have altogether the wrong gospel. And so as God talks about the end of the world, he uses the language the appointed time, the appointed time, the appointed time. And so it will happen. It's, uh, there is no possibility that the appointed time will not happen. The only thing is that we who are studying the Bible and trying to decipher the, uh, the truths of the Bible, try to figure it all out and be as faithful as possible to the Word of God, find that God's 
uh, God's revelation is very complex, very complex. It's not easy at all. And so we are therefore are uh, uh, cautious uh, that we don't get abrasive or aggressive or, or uh, proud or, uh, uh, and, and just say, I know, I know, I know. Don't tell me I'm not right or whatever. No way. We all walk, if we're a true believer, we're going to walk very humbly and uh, simply indicate from everything we can learn thus far, it all seems to fit together on this particular timeline program uh, of uh, uh, finishing up sometime in the year 2011, and yet we're still still studying and studying and and waiting upon the Lord. Maybe, maybe there still might be something that we have missed. But at this point, uh, so far, everything seems to corroborate the fact that this is where we're going. Yeah, you know, I've also heard you say that Israel becoming a nation again in 1948 is one of the major signs that we're near the end. Is that correct? That that's the thing? That is clearly taught to us in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13. Well, you know, there's a very interesting path that goes from the death of, of Shem, the death of Shem in uh, 4488, I believe, to 1948. I'm sorry? There's a path that goes from the death of Shem, the son of Noah, or the death of Shem. The death of Shem. Uh, yes. The son of Noah, whom God chose to build up the nation of Israel through. Yeah. To 1948. That shows that that was the year indeed that God planned for Israel to be a nation again. Um, well, I, I don't know whether. whether the, I do know that when we lay out the calendar that we can discover in the Bible, and God has given us a lot of inf calendar information so we can pinpoint uh, the years when uh, many important people did die. Uh, but in order to see some spiritual significance in this, there has to be some kind of a relationship. And why, uh, uh, at this moment, I don't quite understand how we can tie the death of Shem, who was the first uh, uh, son of uh, uh, one of the sons of Noah, uh, to the rebirth of uh, Israel as a nation, while the time path is a, it seems to be significant. Spiritually, what is significant between those two events? That is the big question. Isn't death in the Bible judgment? So here, national Israel, right up to the end, will never accept Christ as Messiah. They're going to come under God's judgment, like like Shem did. His death represents judgment. Well, Shem represents judgment. Well, no, his death. Anybody's death in the Bible represents God's judgment against them. Uh, well, uh, maybe that's stretching quite far. I I I wouldn't I wouldn't rest a case my case on that very much because. Everybody dies, and uh, then you could say that anybody, any any death age of anybody that we happen to have uh, signifies judgment, and judgment always ties uh, to the end of the world, and uh, uh, that uh, that is that's that certainly is not well. I don't know. I it, 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 to me it doesn't look like it's that significant. But maybe you're correct. Maybe you're correct. Uh, at least you're saying. Uh, you are coming up with a conclusion that uh, in God's timeline of history there are interrelationships that exist between various important dates. But uh, I don't uh, just just to see these interrelationships I, uh, it, in itself, uh, I don't think is sufficient for us to build any kind of a case for anything. It's better if we can see other spiritual considerations that relate the two together. But thank you for calling and sharing, and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hello. Hello. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Oh, let me turn the radio down. Uh, yes, uh, Brother Camping, I'd like to know, um, I know you say that your program is not uh, a 
form where you get into politics. But um, I'd like to know why you have uh, uh, public service messages about oh, uh, well, what's going on in the world today. Yes. And also that um, you have uh, programs over the weekend that are they're kind of political in nature. Well, first of all, the public service announcements are our tax that we pay uh, in order to keep our licenses uh, in good order. Uh, we, uh, the FCC expects every radio station to have a certain number of public service announcements, and we have to faithfully comply with that. That's a very, very minimal kind of a thing that we have to do to remain in good standing with the FCC. And also, um, uh, back uh, uh, to what I was saying in the beginning, um, you don't like to get into politics, but um, uh, throughout the day, um, I hear news stories. I'm sorry, your voice is kind of fading in and out. Uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, during the day, yes. you have... Um, I forget his name. He's a reporter. And the only thing that he reports on is the Middle East. And uh, I know you don't like to talk about things like that. Well, the, the uh, I, I, I don't happen to be here listening to that program, but, you know, uh, there when we have any kind of news on, uh, there are there's the world news and there's local news and because we are a a, a station or a program uh, we have a program service to all of our stations it's easier to talk about world news than to talk about what's happening in somebody's community uh, and so you are going to get that but really all of that is so incidental compared with all the other programming that we have and, uh, and uh, no matter how we design the program, it will not be pleasing altogether to everybody, uh, depending on who the individual is and who is making the decision. And so uh, we, uh, 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 we, I'm sorry if it is, doesn't please you altogether, but I hope that most of the program programming is pleasing to you. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, uh, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, my name is Mr. Felipe Alvarez. I have a question for you. You uh, recently sent a couple of teens to Mexico, Morelia, inside the cities in Mexico. What is the purpose to send those things so that if you personally confirm that you do not preach the gospel? What is the purpose? Now, you're talking about our mission team that went to Leon and uh, Morelia. And, and, what, and again, uh, would you repeat your question? What is the purpose yeah, of what sending is the them purpose? there? So you, you personally says that you do not believe in preaching the gospel. Yes. Yeah, but you see... Uh, 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 a tract like the, have you seen or does God love you tract have you no. personally read it no I just hear him from you well but you see that's uh, it would help you if you could get a copy of the God loves love uh, the, the tract does God love you now if you've ever tried to witness to somebody you sit down next to them in the bus that you're riding on or you meet them or get into conversation with them in one way or another and you you really feel uh, a desire to share the gospel and so you begin to talk about the fact you know sir we uh, all of us are sinners and we're under the wrath of God and and yet God has provided a wonderful way in which we can come out from under the wrath of God and uh, uh, and uh, about that time, you, what am I going to say next? Or about that time, the person you're talking to 
uh, realize what direction you're going, and he doesn't want to hear anymore, and so he uh, he uh, uh, tries to change the subject. Oh, incidentally, he says, what do you think about flying saucers or, or some other strange thing? And it, because he doesn't want to be talked to. But this track, Does God Love You, has been designed so that anyone who starts reading it uh, is going to, uh, he, he can't answer back. In other words, he can't, uh, either, he either has to finish reading it or, or not read it at all or, or just stop wherever he is. But the tract is still there, and it may be that he may not want to read the whole tract, but he gives it to his wife or he gives it to his children or, or he gives it to a friend, and they begin to read it. So that tract is a very wonderful way of sharing the gospel with others. Uh, and it's simply an adjunct to our radio ministry because on the back of the tract it makes reference to Internet where they can continue to listen to family radio. It makes reference to the, the uh, radio broadcast, whether it's shortwave or AM broadcasting, whatever happens to be available in their city. Uh, and so they, if they're interested or, or uh, in, in knowing more about this, uh, this gospel that is laid out in this tract, they know where to look for it. And so that tract is a powerful witnessing tool. It is just another way of carrying out the Great Commission, go ye into all the world with the gospel. And I'm so thankful that we have so many dear people who are ready to take hold of this and, and uh, to further this, this whole idea of going into these cities. When we, when, for example, when we went, when we, the, this mission team came to Leon and Moralia and left there 360,000 tracks. Uh, they, the, these individuals have all left. They're back here in the United States or in Holland where they came from. But the tracks are still there in Mexico. And, and uh, many of them will not be destroyed for, for some time. And, and uh, uh, the, we have no idea how many individuals may read any given track before it finally ends up in the garbage head. We, we don't know. We don't know. But it's there, and it is the Word of God. The verses on the, in that track are right from the Bible, and uh, God can apply those verses to the lives of those who are listening and save them just as easily as any part of the Bible. But well, they, in part, I'm sort of fired because you guys are doing that. You know why? Because in the Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, it says, Jesus Christ, he gave power to the disciples and sent them in to preach the Gospel, which is right. And also it's good because in Mark, chapter 16, he also said, Go all over the world to preach the Gospel, all right? And whosoever... But you see, you, but you see, the preaching of the gospel. Actually, the word preaching is publish, publish the gospel, and and uh, that's why we want to give away Bibles. That's why we want to give away tracts. That's why we want to have this uh, uh, reading from the Bible, explanations from the Bible by radio, uh, and by internet, and uh, and so on. And all of these are in uh, in. Uh, keeping with the command that, that God gives to us to publish the gospel to the world. Uh, but, okay, but I, I, I hope the thing that you guys prepare for the purpose of preaching, uh, to share the gospel, being prepared, because you weren't going to give just give the Bible to someone who don't know how to read it, or they trust. If you do not explain it, what it is but, for. Well, now, excuse me. You have to remember where people don't become saved because they understand. That little child, a year old, uh, cannot understand if, you talk, if he hears the Bible being read. But God can apply that read word to him uh, that, uh, that his mama is reading or his daddy is reading or he's hearing on the radio. 
And God can apply that word to that little one-year-old or that six-month-old baby and save that, that individual. We must remember the work of salvation is God's work. It has no... It, it doesn't mean we have to understand or we, whatever. Now, when we become saved, then we have an intense desire in our life to be obedient to the Word of God and slowly on, uh, depending on our brain capacity, uh, and some are more intellectually able than others, we can learn more and more about what the Bible teaches. But the, but the salvation is not a function of how much theology we know. It has nothing to do with that. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we ha take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Harold. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, my question is, why can't everybody just live in peace and love one another? I know that the world is full of sin, but you would think that at some point mankind would just get tired of it and just decide to get along. Is it just impossible or what? It's impossible because the heart of man is desperately wicked. That's the first thing. Secondly, the ruler of mankind is Satan, who is the very essence of wickedness. So, uh, so you got two major strikes against the idea that somehow mankind will finally uh, 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 get right with each other and begin to love each other and so on. It will not happen. It cannot happen because of the of uh, the nature of man's heart. I have one more question, if I could. My second question. Um is why did God make women so beautiful? I mean, I remember one young woman, I don't even know her, and just because her eyes were so beautiful, I was ready to marry her. <laughs> I don't, why, did, is, is, why is that? Well, you know, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, and you know, I, uh, it's curious that one man uh, falls in love with a, a girl or a woman, uh, and uh, she, he thinks she is the most beautiful woman in the world, and uh, yet uh, ten other men would never say that. But they, on the, on the other hand, have their ideas of what beauty is, and they have found wives in a, uh, uh, that, that appear quite different from this first one. And so, uh, I, but you see, God has designed us so that uh, th that uh, there is a natural attraction between a man and a woman because uh, because the family is the cornerstone of society. It is through the family that seed or that his children are produced, and it is from the children that the true believers come, those who are elected of God. So all of this fits into God's plan, and uh, so. But uh, the, uh, the uh, fact is, when we start really getting serious about marriage, however, we're not going to marry someone because they have beautiful eyes or even because they look beautiful to us. We want to really dig into uh, know what they're thinking about spiritually because that is far more important. Are they beautifully beautiful spiritually or is it just outward physical beauty? But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, this can't be. Uh, I was reading uh, the end of the church age right now, and, and uh, I had some questions on uh, maybe you explain the uh, the three reigns, you know, the, the earlier righteous reign, how uh, the Old Testament believers were saved then, you know. They probably went up with, when they died, they went up, to heaven with Christ, right? But he hadn't paid for their sins yet. And then, then maybe you can um, tell me a little well, bit about the early and the latter rain. Just explain that a little bit. Well, the fact is that when we talk about payment for sins, while it is a fact that uh, uh, there was a year in history, A.D. 33, about 2,000 years ago, when Christ actually had taken on a human nature, actually 
had stood before the judgment throne of God, laden with all the sins of those that he came to save, and actually was punished in equivalent fashion uh, uh, as uh, to them spending an eternity, all these he came to save, spending an eternity in hell. However, the 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 washing power of that action or the efficacy of that action or the however we want to look at it uh, spiritually uh, reached, reached all the way back to the beginning because Christ is the great I am we don't, we don't understand this of course but you know the Bible says that he is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the earth. Now, he actually physically, literally was not slain, but in principle he was because he is the great I Am. When he was slain in A.D. 33, it meant that it was as if he had been slain from before the foundation of the world. When he was slain, he did was not just slain as the Son of Man, he was slain as the Son of God as well as the Son of Man. He is the great I Am. And uh, so... The, uh, the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, already there was in place God's whole salvation plan uh, 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 so that Abel, uh, the, first, the second son of, of Adam and Eve, also could become saved. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for okay. calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Hi, Brother Camping. Um, I I just have a, a question. I haven't called in a long time. But the lady that called up about the the, the news about what's happening in the, the, the Middle the, East, the, yeah. The, the, the war. Yeah. Um, that's, you always teach that has nothing to do with the Word of God or the Bible. And when you have your radio on, that never used to happen on family radio. And when you have your radio on all day and you have to hear that, that gives people conflict. That's why people are calling up and asking about that. And then you say that that has nothing to do with the Bible. I, it should not be being aired. And um, I think... Uh, an explanation you I, I I think you do know what is being aired and why it is being aired it's well, conflicting well, but it is very conflicting and I, you just wait a second and I have one more question um I've been a, a, a partner and I, I'm dirt poor I, I I have a spinal cord injury I make a little over eight hundred dollars a month I've been trying to see you in a conference i I have to bring a care provider to get me and rent a van for my my electric chair and everything, and I can't go because I don't have enough money. Okay, and it's like the story of the rich man and the poor man, Lazarus. And and I just and and when you call up and they won't work with you and they're just saying that's what you that's what you need and that's it. And I just think that that is that is just not. The, I'm sorry, I have to say good night. We've come to the end of our time. I'm sorry, I can't visit any longer. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.